Welcome to Suffolk Matters, where all of Suffolk County meets the men and women of Suffolk AME. News, opinions, and insights you won't hear anywhere else. Here's your host, the president of New York's largest independent union, Suffolk AME's Dan Leveler. Welcome to another edition of Suffolk Matters on Walk 97.5 and 94.3 The Shark, where Suffolk County meets the men and women of Suffolk AME. News and views you can't hear anywhere else. My guest this morning is the New York State Comptroller, Tom DiNapoli. Tom, how are you? Dan, I'm, I'm doing well in spite of all the challenges of what we're going through. I'm thankful that uh, I've been well through COVID, and uh, I hope the same for you and your family and your members. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a rough few months, hasn't it? Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, basically since this challenge started, uh, you know, with the, obviously the healthcare side and then, you know, obviously everybody looking at what the financial impact is going to be. So, you know, you're constantly scouring the news. What's the latest? What, uh, you know, have any rules changed? You know, yeah, it's, it's just, yeah. you know. But I do want to say at the outset of our conversation, you know, the men and women who you, you represent in the Suffolk AME have really been on the front lines of providing such important government services to the people of Suffolk County. I, I know it well, although I'm a Nassau guy, as you know, most of my family now live in Suffolk. And uh, through it all, uh, they've really kept the public service going. And certainly for those of your members who are directly involved, you know, through the Department of Health and other kinds of important services that are that are directly involved with the health care piece, they really have more than risen to the occasion. So, you know, my hat's off to uh, uh, the, the Suffolk AME for uh, your members really pitching in and helping us get through this tough time. And, you know, I think we have to have an optimistic view, right? It's uh, the challenge now that the vaccines are available is making sure that there's enough of a supply and that we communicate with the public as to how they can get an appointment. I know that's been an issue for many people and, and really until we get a greater supply, it's going to continue to be an issue. But, you know, again, uh, the men and women who work for Suffolk County, who you represent, I, I salute each and every one of them really have been helping all of us navigate through a very, very tough time. Yeah, they absolutely stepped up and stepped in and made sure that uh, that that government on a local level was there for the people of Suffolk County in a time of crisis. And I got to tell you, very proud. They make it. You know, we have a slogan, um, Suffolk works because we do. Yeah, and they, yeah. they make it easy to say because they're out there, you know, and it's what they do at their job and it's what they do in their personal life. You know, you can really see it and it's it's easy to be proud of them. We always say, you know, a lot of what I do is state controller. We talk about state government, state finances and so on. But I always try to remind everyone it's local government that is on the front line of this. And uh, without local government functioning, without local government having the revenues uh, that you need, you know, you can't get the job done. And and let me also say, Dan, at the outset, uh, your members are lucky and fortunate to have you speaking out for them, you know, because you have, whether it's been state issues that you and I talk about a great deal or at the local level, you know, working with uh, the Blown administration, you and your team have been a very forceful voice to look out for the interests of uh, the AME members. And especially during this uh, tough time, when there's been a lot of concern about how workers would be treated, would there be adequate safety protections? Uh, you know, you have been there advocating for your members so they could have peace of mind that they, in fact, can do their public service because they've got a strong union behind them who are looking out for that interest and uh, their interests. And, you know, that really, to me, has been the hallmark of your leadership for when you first became president of AME. You have been no stranger in Albany. I know you've been no stranger in Suffolk County, you know, dealing with uh, the administration there. And, uh, you know, I know you, I know you don't get much sleep because you're always, <laughs> you're always doing stuff and, and talking on the phone or, you know, when, when visits were possible. You know, you, I know you've been in Albany and, and I, I know you've been to my city office sometimes. I know we can't do that now uh, right. with everything on hold. But, but you have really been a very energetic and forceful president for AME. And I, I want, you know, your listeners, uh, your members and their families to know uh, that you, you, have, you have been such a hardworking president. And I've seen it firsthand myself. And, you know, sometimes the work that you do may not be obvious to everyone, but folks like me, who you press and who you advocate with and get us to do the right thing, we're, we're well aware of it, and your members should know that as well. 
I definitely I appreciate the kind words and you know it's it's the it's the day of covid there's no playbook for what all of us are doing right in elected office there isn't something that we can all look at and say okay the last time we had a global pandemic yeah. and and the world was the way it is now here's what we did so a lot of a lot of thinking on the fly I think on all levels you know I know I definitely have had to do some adjusting and I'm sure for yourself well, it's been it's been amazing. I mean, just in terms of our operation, right? So, in addition to being, you know, myself as the elected state controller, right? You know, I have an agency. You know, the the office of state controller has uh, about uh, two thousand eight hundred very hardworking public servants, almost all of whom are you know civil service, uh, similar to your membership, represented by CSEA and PEF, are the, are the two uh, big unions uh, in my agency. And we've had, uh, you know, although our main office is Albany and we have a, you know, pretty big presence in New York City, as you well know, we have offices all across the state, regional offices, including one in Hapag, uh, out, out in Suffolk County. Right. And, and we have basically have had all the offices closed except for uh, the main office in Albany. And, and that office, which, you know, on a normal day and normal times might have 1,800 people in the building, uh, it's a big building. It's yeah. all, all of us. Maybe we have fifty or sixty on a given day. Maybe, wow. maybe, maybe close to a hundred if there's something special going on. So uh, everybody pretty much has been working remotely. You know, uh, with, with you know, with, with, with rare exception. Uh, so we've had to reimagine uh, the workplace. Fortunately, we've we've been pretty good as far as technology. In the beginning, we did have to ramp up and and, and uh, get our hands on some more laptops, but. You know, I've been very proud, uh, just as you're proud of your members, how they've continued their their job. My my colleagues have really kept to the mission. So, you know, the state payroll is getting processed. You know, state payments are being made. Contracts are being approved. Pension checks are going out. Uh, if if folks have a, a question on, on uh, their retirement, if they're, you know, an active employee thinking about retirement, you know, we've still been able to get those questions answered. And, and Dan, let me say, you know, to... You know, to your members who are listening, if if they do have any questions, a lot of it often relates to to people having pension questions if they're thinking of retiring or changing beneficiary information. If they ever have any issue getting through, because there are some days where our call center gets backlogged, and again, keep in mind everybody's working remotely and managing it. Tell them to be in touch with with, with you, Dan, and you you know how to find me, and we'll make sure that no one is left waiting for an answer if they're trying to reach us on on, on any pension related question. Uh, listen, I very much appreciate that, and that's you know that's something that public employees deeply care about. You know, they they tend to work difficult jobs, altruistic in nature, uh, and 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 maybe aren't compensated uh, as great as maybe the private sector might pay someone. Uh, but, but they have that at the end of it all, they have that, that cushion, that, that little bit of pension money that comes in and helps carry them through the rest of their lives. And so it is always a focus, you know, public servants are, are always, you know, and, and I think the public should appreciate that as well, because a public servant isn't going to jeopardize all of the hard work they've done, uh, you know, by doing the wrong thing, you know, they're very, they're very cautious and, and careful to do the right thing in their work. Yeah. And retirement security is such a big issue, uh, out there. I wish it would have gotten more attention in the presidential election and the debate. It was barely touched upon, but, you know, we, we've seen over many years, uh, most in the private sector, you know, most of the, uh, big companies that, uh, years ago had, you know, defined benefit pensions, they moved away from that. And whatever short-term benefit that might have given uh, the company, the, the, the long-term harm in terms of most folks in the private sector now not having a defined benefit pension uh, really hurts people in their, in their later years. And, uh, and I think you, you point out, you know, the trade-off that many people make when they choose to be in public service rather than private sector is that generally speaking, you know, there are exceptions and uh, I acknowledge that, but generally speaking, the, you know, the pay for someone in, uh, in, in civil service in the public sector is going to be less than what you can make in the private sector. But the trade-off is you get that defined benefit pension uh, at the end of your at the end of your service. And the other thing, you know, I like to remind people, and your members are well aware of this, you don't 
work just for a couple of years and get yourself a nice pension. You know, the, the people who get a pension, they're putting in 20, 25, 30, 35 years uh, to get a pension. I, 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 I get upset sometimes, you know, when Newsday or the press like to pr- print an article about someone, you know, getting a, a, a high pension. And the reality is that those that get those, you know, six-figure pensions are like less than half a percent of our of our pensioners in, in, in our system. And, you know, the, the average, you know, pension still in New York State is about 25000 uh, and And it goes to people who put in many, many years of service. And now, of course, as you know, with the new tiers that were put in Tier 5, right. which is now closed, Tier 6, you know the benefits aren't as generous as they were, and you have to put more, you know more years in to get what you know folks in tier three and four and those few uh, who are left tier ones every right, now and then I right. I meet a tier one in the elevator in my building. There's still a few of them out there, but you know the benefit structure has changed and 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 really has uh, become more limited. You know, so uh, I I think you know sometimes those that attack uh, the public pensions they really don't look uh, at at the the, the full picture picture. Uh, I mean, certainly, you know, as you know, police and fire pensions are higher, but those are folks who, you know, it's a different compensation package and it's a different kind of job. You know, yeah, and those are yeah. folks who literally are putting their lives on the line. So that's part of the reward, you know, for doing that dangerous work is that they, they have a more generous pension structure. But, you know, by and large, for the folks who you represent and the 94% of the members in our state pension system, you know, they're, they're providing municipal or state services and, you uh, it takes a lot of years of dedicated service to get that that uh, decent pension, uh, which in many cases, you point out, is is relatively modest. But you know what? It's a lot better than only having a 401k to rely on because, you know, that's what that's what's happened in the private sector. And if you hit it wrong, right? If you hit the market wrong, right? Even if you've gotten great financial advice, but if you're, yeah, I mean, I just, I think back 10 years ago, right, when the Great Recession hit and took a long time to pull out from that. Yeah. Folks who were like in their early 60s thinking of retiring, their 401ks cut in half, if, if not even more so, you know, and, and many of them couldn't retire. Many, many of them probably are still working now. Uh, and, you know, we've had a volatile market, you know, this year. Right. With our talking right now, things obviously are better than they were last March. But but if you, if, if you, if you hit the market wrong through no fault of your own, you don't have that security, at least with a defined benefit pension. You know what, you know what you're going to get. You can plan accordingly. And, and, and that's a level of security that, you know, for so many people who choose uh, to work in government, that's, that's what makes it worthwhile. Yeah, it really is. It's vital. And, you know, you touched on, I guess, a little bit the dangers of misinformation as well. You know, uh, yeah. when, when you see an article and it, it talks about one person and their pension and, and then people start getting the idea that like, oh, that's everyone. But the fact yeah. of the matter is that, you know, the real numbers bear out very differently. Yeah. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. But it's you know, with the work that we do, and and you've been, you know, incredibly supportive, and I appreciate that in terms of protecting uh, that retirement benefit. Uh, you know, we have many responsibilities in the controller's office, but uh, making sure that the pension fund stays well funded obviously is is of a very high priority for me and my team. No, and listen, I know uh, from my my perspective, and I can speak on behalf of my members, we are all. Very grateful to have you at the helm as sole fiduciary, making sure that uh, the investment returns are are the primary concern when when dealing with investments, uh, and, and ensuring that we have you know that solvency there to be able to pay people out in retirement. You know, some states really face a, a big challenge with that. But you know, with that in mind, you know, we're, we're seeing you know there's a few things we can talk about, and and you know the state budget comes to mind. But one of the things I think that's really important to point out that's, you know, it's it's getting exciting actually a little is is this green energy investment strategy. And I just wanted to get your take on that as a concept. Yeah, I mean, look, I think it's the way we, we all have to go. I, I think it's the way American society has to go. It's the way the the world community has to go. Climate change is a risk to uh, the planet and our health and our well-being. Uh, it's a risk to our economy. Uh, it's 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 a, a risk to our pension fund. We look at that from the investment perspective, and um, you know I was pleased uh, Joe Biden got elected president, and obviously we're seeing, you know, just this uh, past week, uh, announcements showing how uh, very different from the prior administration. You know, he really is supporting a a green agenda, uh, if we could label it that. Uh, right. 
right, right. For, for simplicity's sake, you know, to really um, deal with the issue of, of, of climate, but also uh, to help the economy. I mean, Lord knows the economy has been ravaged by COVID, and, you know, we need to look for new opportunities as far as creating jobs. And as part of this transition to the low, lower carbon economy that the Paris Agreement uh, envisions, and the U.S. is now back with everybody else, literally everybody else, every other country on, uh, on the right, planet right. as part of the Paris Agreement. You know, we should we should work uh, not to defend the old ways of doing things things that are that are falling by the wayside, but how could we maximize the opportunities with you know renewable energy, be it wind or solar or, 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 or more hydro uh, fuel cells electric vehicles, and you saw one of the executive orders he signed would be for the federal government to buy uh, electric vehicles that are made in America by union labor. You know, so there are ways to think about this, because I, I think it's important to, to be part of that transition, but we also have to recognize there are a lot of folks that have worked in the traditional industries that are now starting to, to wind down, and, and, and nobody should be left unemployed because of that. So, you know, we've got we've got to be thoughtful in terms of of understanding the transition is going to take time and be smart about it and and for those that may be dislocated from jobs, you know, let's say they were working for an oil company, make sure that we're creating those other opportunities that they could take advantage of, you know, so that no family is 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 hurt by this. But I think there is a smart and a thoughtful way to do it, and I think the Biden administration because they're putting such a priority on this and really dedicating significant staff uh, resources at the top level uh, to direct this. I, I, I think it's going to work. I, I'm going to be an optimist about it. Yeah, no, I, I, listen, I agree. And then on top of that, you know, there's always that concept of stranded assets, right? And if yep. you think about that in terms of jobs, and you touched on it already, you know, there's folks that have training in a particular field, and that field may need to transition to newer, better ways of doing things. But I know even out here on Long Island, you know, we're looking at, uh, you know, wind capacity. Yep. Uh, but but one of the first things that, that's been committed to is a training center to make sure that people know how to install, repair, service, you know, all of all of what's necessary. And, and those jobs are going to come from industries that were the were the old way of doing things. Uh, so yeah. just just making sure that, you know, people have that ability to transition in. And that's, you know, I think that's that's an advantage of labor. Labor doesn't just look at, uh, you know, wind energy is better, uh, the investments are better or whatever else, but we we look at the lives, the human beings and how it's impacted. So I think there's a lot of smart ideas here. And I think, you know, it, it, it makes for a better world. Yeah, but I think everybody's got to be patient too. I mean, I, 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 I worry, you know, and you and I have talked uh, before about this, especially as it impacted on the pension fund, you know, and I really... Again, want to express my appreciation to you, you know, for really being one of the true labor champions for us when uh, folks were trying to have a legislative mandate that the pension fund would have to sell all of our, you know, current holdings in oil and gas, uh, really on a very short time frame, uh, just to try to send a signal or a message or, you know, uh, a feel-good uh, slogan on the environment and in a way that would harm. Uh, in the short run, uh, our investment strategy really undercut it. Uh, and you really stood up and said, you know, pension fund decisions have to be made for the interest of the members. And you understood that we were already were taking some important steps to really deal with the risk of, of climate change and to transition our portfolio uh, to take advantage of those opportunities we were just talking about, but that we needed to do it in a thoughtful way that wouldn't hurt uh, our returns or, or hurt our members. And, uh, I, you know, thanks to your standing up and really answering some of those who are pushing a little too hard and oversimplifying the debate, uh, we were able to get to a point where the legislature, uh, legislative leaders like Senator Kruger, who, who was sponsoring that uh, divestment bill, uh, reached out to me and said, hey, you know, could we find some common ground here? And I was very pleased that we were able to come up with an agreement uh, with Senator Kruger uh, that got great support among the legislature where uh, we are going to continue implementing our climate action plan to deal with the issues we just just touched on, but uh, do it perhaps a little more quickly, uh, a little more clear time frames than we had first uh, uh, set out. But the legislature would no longer micromanage by law how we handle our pension fund investments. And I think that was a very important precedent 
to protect the independence of the fiduciary role of the controller's office. Because if, if you start having pension fund decisions being made, uh, like a, 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 in a stadium with a political football, uh, yeah. on all kinds of issues, that that's how the, the strong pension system we have, which is among the best funded in the country, it's not going to stay well funded because everything is going to be about politics. But Dan, you you were on the front line of standing up and saying, we understand there's an issue with, with climate and the environment, but you can't hurt the pension fund while you're trying to do the right thing. And I'm very pleased we were able to slow down the momentum for that bill and, and also pleased we, we had a very open and, and positive dialogue with the advocates for that bill. And now, now we're in a common spot, and, 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 and that's going to be good because we're going to, with the pension fund, see some of those opportunities you and I were just talking about. Yeah. We have a, you know, that climate solutions and, and sustainable bucket of our investments. We're looking to invest in, in those uh, emerging green industries, going to make money for the pension fund. But again, doing it, doing it with a, with a smart view as to how we're going to look out for the benefit of the pension fund, not do a political uh, management of the fund, which would be, as I said, would really undercut our strength. Yeah, no, it was, that's, that was something that was very important to us, uh, something I reached out to you right away on. You know, we saw these conversations, and they were talking about an aspect of, you know, what, what they were trying to do, but they weren't really focusing on what, something that we felt was very important, and that's the mandate that you have to make sure that you're making the best investments possible to keep that pension system funded. You know, our members rely on that. They dedicated their lives to public service, uh, and they want to be sure that what they work so hard for is there for them in the end. And, you know, I, again, I, I guess I want to overstate for clarity in a sense. Uh, you know, you could envision something like this starting and then eventually getting to the point where, you know, any any issue of the day is now, yeah. you know, and then it just start, you know, mandates just start flying from everywhere. So our position and I think labor's position really needs to be the sole fiduciary status of the comptroller's office must be preserved. Yeah, no. And you're you're stepping out. And I, I appreciate it. You, you know, you, you wrote some very helpful uh, uh, op eds that appeared even in uh, the Albany Times Union. Right. It, just, yes. it, it wasn't just on Long Island. Your voice was being heard across the state. And it made a big difference because you were speaking on behalf of people who were directly affected by the pension fund. So it's great when when folks who aren't members are expressing their opinions. They have no skin in the game. You were speaking for the folks who have real skin in the game, and it made a big difference. I appreciate it. So, you know, again, a, a, another another big item uh, to talk about. You know, we have this proposed budget from the governor's office out there. Uh, and you know, there's interesting things, you know, going throughout, you know, and that's just part of, part of what I do. Part of what you do is going through and taking a look at all of that. And the, you know, I, I, I guess, I guess I have a few questions, you know, overall one, you know, how do you feel about the budget? Well, look, it's a tough time to be making a budget because there are so many unknowns out there. And, and I, you know, I'll, I'll say a couple things. I mean, at the end of the day, I, I respect that it's, it's the role of the legislators, the senators, the assembly members of the governor to come up with a budget. So I, I try hard not to tell them what choices they need to make in terms of how much money to spend where. But I look at kind of the big picture in terms of, of budget balance. So, you know, he's he's really put together a, in a sense, a um, – a two scenario budget proposal, you know, a a I guess worst case scenario uh that we get a minimal amount of federal aid, uh, 6 6 billion over the next 2 years and that would trigger uh certain budget cuts. It would um trigger uh a, a higher tax on uh higher income New Yorkers, uh some other provisions that folks might not consider uh uh, desirable, but what the governor feels he needs to uh, to keep some uh, basic level of services uh, continuing, and then he presented the the what he labeled the fair uh, budget option, which is based on an assumption of fifteen billion dollars over two years of uh, of aid from Washington, which would um, would not have the budget cuts that were in the the the, the initial proposal would would also not have uh, the tax increase. Um, you know, it really underscores that we're really waiting to see what what else comes out of Washington. We've appreciated the support we've gotten thus far, but it's it's fallen way short of what's needed. 
you know, COVID-19, putting the economy on hold, what that has done to government revenues, both for Suffolk County and, and, and for New York State. It's, it's been severe. I mean, just look at the how sales tax has been off, uh, people that haven't been working, so many people in the private sector, you know, uh, laid off, small businesses closing and so on, you know. So our tax revenue, you know, certainly has been down, and then that affects, you know, government spending all across the board. So, you know, if New York State has to deal with its budget problems by cutting uh, services because so much of the state budget goes back to localities, that's going to impact on Suffolk County, uh, on sure. Suffolk County municipal services, school districts, and so on. You know, so the real challenge for us right now uh, is is what else is going to come from Washington? Again, the good news there is that the new administration and the new majorities in Congress have been much more supportive than 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 the previous crowd of providing direct aid to states and localities. But you know, the one point nine trillion dollar package that uh, President Biden proposed, that's a proposal. It has not been enacted yet. Right, so right. we don't we don't know what it finally is going to look like. But you know, Dan, the problem is we we are very much dependent right now on what Washington does, and we you know we need Washington to do that more favorable. Uh, uh, package, $15 billion or, or, or hopefully close to it, as the governor has, has called for. And that's just for the short term. We still have out-year budget gaps of you know over $27 billion. And again, ultimately, if New York has to face any budget cuts, uh, much of that is going to fall uh, on local assistance, aid to Suffolk County, right. municipalities and school districts. We have to avoid that because that just, that just puts our problem down to the local level, and that ultimately can impact on your members, could impact on, on property taxes. You know, the, the implications are clear. I hate to put it all back on Washington, but uh, so much of, of, of how we're going to put this budget together is going to depend on what we're going to be getting from Washington, how much, and how soon. Yeah, and, it, you know, it really does belong on Washington because it's not just New York State facing these problems. And as you point out, you know, states mandate that local governments do certain things. Uh, and if the revenue isn't there to pay for it, then, you know, the taxpayer ultimately pays that price. We need the federal government to, you know, New York is a donor state. We give more in taxes than we receive in aid. It's not the case with other states. Some states actually pay less and receive more. Yeah, I'm, uh, glad you, I'm glad you mentioned that. We do a, a regular reporting on that. For every dollar we send to Washington, New York gets back 91 cents. The average for states is for every dollar they get back a dollar and 24 cents. And in fact, we're one of only seven states uh, that gives more to Washington in our tax revenue than we get back in federal spending. And and we're actually at the bottom of the list. We we have the highest uh, dollar amount of imbalance between what we send to Washington and what we get back. Uh, but we understand that we're, you know, we're a more wealthy state. But, you know, uh, given how hard we were hit by the pandemic, really the first state to be hit and hit so hard when we were just learning how to deal with it, uh, you know, having a little more understanding would be appreciated. But also, you made another important point, and I always uh, mention this. We're not just asking for money for New York. I mean, every state in the union has been impacted uh, to some degree. And, and, you know, for the country to get back on its feet economically, we need the states to, to, to be solvent and back on their, on their feet. And, you know, the states and the localities are on the front lines of dealing with the pandemic, helping, trying to help businesses get back uh, into business. So, you know, it really is in the national interest to make the states and our localities uh, whole through this uh, budget challenge that we're going through. And and uh, look, the reality is Washington has more access to, to money than we, than we do. We have more access to the state level, more revenue sources than you do in Suffolk County or than our school districts or villages or, you know, or towns have. But uh, we don't have as much ability to, you know, we don't print money. So we don't have the same powers that Washington has to generate revenue. This is a crisis and Washington needs to step up. Yeah, I completely agree. You know, and again, on the state level with the state budget, there are a couple of ideas to help generate revenue. Revenue, We hear about, uh, you know, the gambling and the recreational marijuana, and we'll see if those things materialize. Well, there's a good chance they will. There's probably more interest in that now than there has been. You know, again, I'll let the legislature decide on this, although I, you know, our experience when we've expanded casino casinos in the state, as an example, it never quite generates the revenue that the advocates think it's going to generate. So I, I think just my word of caution, you know, uh, on that and whether it's sports betting, uh, particularly, I think, uh, you know, the state has 
could do a better job if you can expand gaming, uh, put more money into those programs to help people who fall into that uh, addiction to gambling. You know, a lot of a lot of families are ruined by uh, by someone who bec- is, has a compulsive uh, gambling habit, and we need to do more to make sure that folks don't fall into that trap, or if they do, uh, that we help them. So if you can expand it, make sure you're putting more money into dealing with that addiction as well. No, I, I completely agree. You know, and just as we close up today, uh, you know, you have a long history of protecting taxpayers, and one of the ways you do that is, you know, taking undertaking audits, finding, you know, waste and fraud. Uh, are there any achievements that you think that you would you, like want to share with people that you've been most proud of in your, in, as a comptroller? Well, you know, in terms of that area, you know, we, we, we've, we've kept a very active uh, audit program, state agencies, local governments, and we really have beefed up our, our, our investigative uh, unit. So uh, in the most extreme case of, of fraud and ripping off taxpayers, you know, we have a, a special team that's dedicated when our auditors find uh, someone stealing, and that happens too often. You know, folks, uh, there's not checks and balances in a, in a, in a government. Uh, it could be a, a state agency. It, it, it often is a local government. Uh, we hold them accountable, and, and, and I'm, I'm sorry to report. I, I, I don't want to... I don't want to make it sound like I'm bragging on this, but we we have, with that work of that unit, been involved with law enforcement in over 220 arrests of uh, of public officials, some elected, some appointed, uh, who uh, were embezzling or stealing uh, money, public money, uh, and we've gotten back about 60 million dollars in restitution. Uh, that's the most extreme case, but our audits also, you know, really look to promote efficiency. This week we put out our fiscal stress monitoring that we do of of all local governments. We put out our list for school districts uh, this past week. Uh, so, you know, the Medicaid program, a very high-cost area, you know, literally over the past few years, we've identified billions of dollars in opportunities to save money you know, without hurting the service to, to people who need uh, the the important Medicaid services. So, so you know, we, we believe strongly in, you know, uh, the value of government, the importance of government uh, services, and the public employees who provide it. But we also understand that there are ways we could be smarter and be more efficient. And, you know, that's where we, we really come in, uh, in in that accountability role. And, and I've often said, especially as we're scrutinizing a tough budget, you know, folks should look at our audits. We make a lot of recommendations, too often of which uh, don't get implemented. There are ways to, to be more efficient and save money without laying anybody off or without cutting back on a service. So we want to continue to highlight our audit work in that area. No, listen, I appreciate it. You know, in that way, you've been a friend to everyone in New York, and you have absolutely been a friend to labor throughout your time as comptroller. Uh, and well into the future. I appreciate you joining us this morning. Uh, again, my guest this morning was New York State Comptroller Thomas DiNapoli. Tom, thank you for joining us this morning. Dan, it's always a pleasure. Thank you. Stay well. Absolutely. You as well. And to our listeners, we'll speak to you next week. We'll speak to you next week. We'll speak to you next week. We'll speak to you next week.